The Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, the album that would create a shockwave in popular music for decades to come. Arguably one of the greatest leaps in music in modern history, this album is considered a masterpiece, and for good reason. Today we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. Let's do this. Sgt. Pepper and the concept behind the album originated on Paul's flight back to London in 1966. The band was fed up with being the Beatles and all the pressure that came with their fame. Therefore, Paul got the idea that they should ditch those personas and take on new ones. He says the following explains his thought process. I thought, let's not be ourselves. Let's develop alter egos so we're not having to project an image which we know. It would be much more free. What would really be interesting would be to actually take on the personas of this different band. We could say, how would somebody else sing this? He might approach it a bit more sarcastically perhaps, so I had this idea of giving the Beatles alter egos simply to get a different approach. Then when John came up to the microphone, or I did, it wouldn't be John or Paul singing, it would be the members of this band. It would be a freeing element. I thought we can run this philosophy through the whole album. With this alter ego band, it won't be us making all that sound. It won't be the Beatles. It'll be this other band. So we'll be able to lose our identities in this. The album's cover art and production was very unique. It was designed by Peter Blake and Jan Howarth and consists of cardboard cutouts and wax figures of famous actors, gurus, scientists, and more. John even wanted Jesus and Hitler included in the crowd, an idea that was turned down because of the inevitable controversy that would ensue. The cover cost a total of 3,000 pounds, over 50,000 pounds in today's money, which made it the most expensive album cover to date in 1967. It typically cost 50 to 75 pounds to produce a cover. However, this was money well spent, as the Sgt. Pepper's album cover is one of the most iconic and recognizable in music history. Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane were supposed to be on the Sgt. Pepper album. These were the first two songs the band started recording for the album, but EMI pressured them into releasing the songs as a double A-side single. Therefore, the tracks were left off the album. George Martin, the Beatles producer, has said that this decision was the biggest mistake of my professional life. Although they are just as iconic off the album, imagine what Sgt. Pepper would have been like if it had included these epic songs. Three songs off the album were banned by the BBC. A Day in the Life was banned because of the line, I'd love to turn you on, which the BBC thought encouraged drug use. Paul and John have mentioned that this line was meant to elicit a controversial reaction. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was banned because the BBC believed it was a reference to the drug LSD, although both Paul and John have denied this multiple times. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite was banned because of the phrase Henry the Horse, because it combined two common slang terms for heroin. However, John denied that song was related to heroin at all. He did use it though, but... Although the album is loved by fans, some of the Beatles look back at the recording session with much less enthusiasm. It's hard to imagine the production of one of the greatest albums of all time as being dull, but this is exactly how George felt during the studio sessions. He says, a lot of the time it ended up with Paul just playing the piano and Ringo keeping the tempo, and we weren't allowed to play as a band so much. It became an assembly process, just little parts and then overdubbing. And so for me, it became a bit tiring and a bit boring. Ringo also recalls being bored. He was much less involved than everyone else and says he learned how to play chess while they were recording. John also had a slightly indifferent perspective about the album, specifically the songs he contributed. He was proud of A Day in the Life, but he says many of his other songs like Good Morning, Good Morning and Mr. Kite were just throwaways. Sgt. Pepper is responsible for many firsts in the music industry. It was the first album to include song lyrics on the album sleeve cover, which is now very common. It was also the first album to forego gaps between tracks, called banding, making the album sound like one continuous song. And although highly debated, it is considered one of the first concept albums. Newspaper headlines were responsible for inspiring some of Sgt. Pepper's songs. Headlines from the Daily Mirror and the Daily Mail sparked the idea for Paul's She's Leaving Home and John's A Day in the Life. Paul saw a story in the newspaper about a girl running away from home and, coincidentally, had actually met the girl years ago on a TV show, although he was not aware of the connection. As for John, he says the following about his inspiration. 
I was writing the song with the Daily Mail propped up in front of me on the piano. I had it open to the news in brief, or whatever they call it. The concentric run-out groove, which is the loop that plays at the end of the record, has a very interesting story. The Beatles wanted a snippet of loud, unidentifiable noise to play on forever, or until someone lifted the needle off the record player. Barry Miles, who worked with the Beatles and was present for some of the Sgt. Pepper sessions, says the following about recording this piece. It was a triple session, three three-hour sessions, which ended around 4 a.m. The Beatles stood around two microphones muttering, singing, snatches of songs, and yelling for what seemed like hours, with the rest of us standing around them, joining in. Some fans have theorized that there's actually a hidden message in this recording, and when played backwards, they hear multiple things. However, the strangest is definitely, we'll you like Superman. which Paul has denied many times. Good, he should have. The album is rumored to have taken 700 hours to complete. Much of that time was spent figuring out the complex arrangements and rehearsing the songs, not necessarily recording. However, this was still an unheard of amount of time to work on an album for, even for the Beatles. For comparison, their first album, Please Please Me, took just under 10 hours to complete. Sgt. Pepper changed more than just music. On top of popularizing psychedelic rock and making it more mainstream, it had a huge social and cultural influence. It was the countercultural movement soundtrack, particularly during the 1967 Summer of Love, as it symbolized the hope and change that was occurring in social consciousness. It preached love, acid, spirituality, and more to the youth that was craving a more open and loving society. There has been no album since that has been such a significant impact musically or socially. And for this, we are forever grateful for the masterpiece that is Sgt. Pepper's. The Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour is not just an album, but a song and a movie, and is one of the most playful works of art the Beatles have ever produced. Today, we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour. Let's begin. Magical Mystery Tour is a movie. In the film, the Beatles go around the countryside of England in a bus with ordinary people, and along the way, strange things happen to them at the hands of magicians, also played by the Beatles. It's 52 minutes of pure randomness, paired with a psychedelic aesthetic and soundtrack. People either love it or hate it. Paul got the idea for the film from Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters, who traveled around the US in a rainbow school bus with a group of fellow hippies, spreading the word about LSD. Paul also wanted to combine this concept with the bus tours that happened in England. Paul says the following about developing the idea for the film. John and I remembered mystery tours, and we always thought this was a fascinating idea, getting on a bus and not knowing where you're going. Rather romantic and slightly surreal. All these old dears with the blue rinses going off to mysterious places. Generally, there's a crate of ale in the boot of the coach and you sing lots of songs. So we took that idea and used it as a basis for a song and the film. There was no main script for the film, and much of it was improvised. The film was shot with only a few loose sketches and handwritten ideas, which Paul called the script. Furthermore, it was only when the actors got on the bus that they realized they would be improvising most of the scenes. The lack of organization is one of the main reasons why the footage ended up being so random, causing the film to ultimately be a chaotic mess. The film aired in black and white when it was released. The color television had only come out six months prior to the air date in Britain, and few households owned one. Therefore, the film received awful reviews upon initial release, as it is incredibly colorful and derives almost all of its value from its visually stimulating experience. The movie was a flop, but the album was a success. The Magical Mystery Tour film was released in the UK December 26, 1967, and received awful reviews, and many people even claimed that it was the Beatles' first ever failure. However, the album was massively popular. It stayed at the top of the American charts for eight weeks, and was nominated for a Grammy in 1969. Magical Mystery Tour has a very unique track listing. The A side of the album is made up of songs from the film soundtrack, which includes Magical Mystery Tour, The Fool on the Hill, Flying, Blue Jay Way, Your Mother Should Know, and I Am the Walrus. On the other hand, the B side is made up of the band's singles from 1967, including Hello Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, Baby You're a Rich Man, and All You Need Is Love. 
Magical Mystery Tour contains the first song credited to all four Beatles, Flying, an instrumental track made for the film, was given the credit Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, Starr. On this song, John played the Mellotron, Paul plays guitar and bass, George plays guitar, and Ringo plays maracas and drums. In addition to these instruments, all four Beatles sing and harmonize to a wordless chant. The first recording for Magical Mystery Tour took place before Sgt. Pepper was released on April 25th, 1967. The Beatles started recording the theme song for the film called Magical Mystery Tour. They wouldn't start filming the movie and the rest of the album for another few months, meaning lots happened between this gap. In addition to releasing Sgt. Pepper, they performed All You Need Is Love on the One World broadcast and began their studies with the Maharishi. Paul finally convinced the band to pick up Magical Mystery Tour a few weeks after the death of their manager, Brian Epstein. There is a debate about who the walrus is. In the film, it is clear that John is wearing the walrus costume. However, on the cover, it was later stated that Paul was wearing the walrus costume. This would account for John singing The Walrus Was Paul in the song Glass Onion on the White Album. Additionally, on the track listing in the inside of the cover, under this song, I Am The Walrus, is a line that says, No, you're not. Who do you think the walrus was? Magical Mystery Tour further paved the way for psychedelic music. The album's success showed just how popular this genre of music was and how embedded it was into the growing musical landscape. Released just a few months after the masterpiece that was Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour demonstrated the Beatles' commitment to experimenting in the studio and producing original and innovative sounds. The Beatles' self-titled album, commonly known as The White Album, is one of their most controversial releases of their career, a double LP with a massive amount of fan-favorite songs like Dear Prudence, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, Blackbird, Julia, and Helter Skelter. The White Album is a powerhouse collection of songs, so today we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about The Beatles' White Album. Let's begin. The White Album's original working title was A Doll's House, named that after Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen's 1879 play. But the Beatles had to change it because the British prog group Family released their debut album, Music in a Doll's House, in July 1968. So through some deliberation, the band decided to title their album The Beatles, their first self-titled album. Going back to February 1968, when the Beatles were visiting Rishikesh to learn transcendental meditation for a few weeks, they found the atmosphere incredibly inspiring in terms of songwriting, writing mainly on acoustic guitars and picking up a few finger-picking methods from Donovan. India proved to be the birthplace of many of the White Album's songs, including, but not limited to, the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, Why Don't We Do It in the Road, I'm So Tired, Mother Nature's Son, I Will, and Sex Sadie, the latter being a cheeky commentary from John on the Maharishi and some of his unseemly behavior. After returning to England from their extended stay in India, the group went over to George Harrison's Escher Bungalow in May 1968 to record demo versions of their new song. These are called the Escher Demos. They recorded approximately 27 songs on George's Ampex reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. 19 of these songs would later appear on the White Album, and it's unclear how many songs were actually recorded first at George's house, seeing that it's possible the lads could have recorded separately and brought them in for overdubbing and further review. But the Escher Demos are a great resource for any Beatles fans wanting to hear Beatles songs in their infancy, how they started and how they ended up. By the summer of 1968, the Beatles were working separately more and more, and George Martin wasn't always impressed with what they were composing in this regard. Something had changed. George Martin says, they came in with a whole welter of songs. I think they were over 30, actually, and I was a bit overwhelmed by them and yet underwhelmed at the same time because some of them weren't great. I thought we should have probably have made a very, very good single album rather than a double, but they insisted. I think it could have been made fantastically good if it had been compressed a bit and condensed. A lot of people I know still think it's the best album they made. By the time to record the White Album, John had begun divorcing Cynthia and was fully in love with Yoko Ono and began using heroin. The Beatles rarely invited outsiders to the recording, and this caused quite a bit of strain on the already fragmented Beatles. Paul recalls this shift saying, it was fairly off-putting having her sitting on one of the amps. You wanted to say, excuse me, love, can I turn the volume up? We were always wondering how to say, 
could you get off my amp without interfering with the relationship? It was a very difficult time. I felt that when John finally left the group, he did it to clear the decks for his relationship. Anything prior to that meant the decks weren't clear. He had all his Beatles baggage, all his having to relate to us. He just wanted to go off into the corner and look into Yoko's eyes for hours saying to each other, it's going to be all right. It was pretty freaky. Looking at it now, you can be amused by it. It was quite a laugh, really. But at the time, this was us and it was our careers. We were the Beatles, after all. And here was this girl. The Beatles' White Album was a very tense one to make. A few months into recording, the band was splitting up more and more. Paul had recorded Wild Honey Pie, Mother Nature's Son, and Blackbird, all without the other Beatles. And if they would record together, it would be almost like having a Beatles member as a sessions player, not the usual contributor. Engineer Ken Scott recalls what happened when John and Ringo walked into one of Paul's session times, saying, Suddenly, halfway through, John and Ringo walked in, and you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. An instant change. It was like that for 10 minutes, and then as soon as they left, it felt great again. It was very bizarre. But John wanted to play with Paul. But it seems with all the tension, drug busts, drug use, and new relationships, it was all too much. John says he wanted to be on the song, Why Don't We Do It On The Road, but couldn't for some reason. John says, that's Paul. He even recorded it by himself in another room. That's how it was getting in those days. We came in and he'd made the whole record. Him drumming, him playing the piano, him singing. But he couldn't. He couldn't. Maybe he couldn't make the break from the Beatles. I don't know what it was. You know, I enjoyed the track. Still, I can't speak for George, but I was always hurt when Paul would knock something off without involving us. But that's just the way it was then. Jeff Emmerich, who had been working with the Beatles since Revolver, decided it was time to abandon ship because he couldn't work under their toxic conditions. And George Martin, who was with the Beatles for the majority of the professional career, felt the pressure compounding to the point where he abruptly left on holiday, leaving the band to be produced by his assistant, Chris Thomas. Martin says, for the first time, I had to split myself three ways because at any one time we were recording in different studios. It became very fragmented. Poor Ringo felt like he was being pulled in every which way and was fed up with his band dissolving in front of his eyes. So he quit. Ringo says, I left because I felt two things. I felt I wasn't playing great. And I also felt that the other three were really happy and I was an outsider. I went to see John, who had been living in my apartment in Montague Square with Yoko. I said, I'm leaving the group because I'm not playing well and I feel unloved and out of it. And you three are really close. And John said, I thought it was you three. While Ringo took his vacation, the rest of the band felt guilty for their behavior and extended an olive branch. Ringo continues, I got a telegram saying, you're the best rock and roll drummer in the world. Come on home. We love you. And so I came back. We all needed that little shake-up. When I got back to the studio, I found George had had it decked out with flowers. There were flowers everywhere. I felt good about myself again. We got through that little crisis, and it was great. Although the recording process was mired with issue after issue, Ringo actually holds the White Album in great esteem, even over Sgt. Pepper's, saying, Sgt. Pepper's did its thing. It was the album of the decade, of the century maybe. It was very innovative, with great songs. It was a real pleasure, and I'm glad I was on it, but the White Album ended up being a better album for me. Released on November 22nd, 1968, in the UK, five years to the day of their second album with the Beatles, the White Album has become the Beatles' best-selling album hitting platinum 19 times, and it is the 10th best-selling album of all time in the United States. It's remarkable that even though this was the crucial chapter of the Beatles' breakup, they were still able to create such a beloved album. The Beatles Let It Be, the album that would ultimately be their last released album as a group, a return to the roots of rock and roll that the band had cultivated during the 60s. Let It Be gave us songs like Across the Universe, The Long and Winding Road, and Two of Us. Today, we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Let It Be. Let's begin. Let It Be was originally meant to be a live in-studio album and movie, and was called The Get Back Project. It was designed by Paul in order to bring life and energy back into the band, after the White Album had caused so much tension. Paul wanted it filmed in order to show the band's process. He says, the idea was that you'd see the Beatles rehearsing, jamming, getting their act together, and then finally performing, somewhere in a big end of show concert. 
Although Let It Be was the final album the Beatles released, the majority of Let It Be was recorded throughout January 1969, but the band shelved the tapes and started working on Abbey Road before Let It Be was even ready to be released. Therefore, there is a debate amongst Beatles fans as to which album is considered their last. And if this is truly a significant distinction to make, what do you think? Let It Be was meant to be taken on tour, as Paul was eager to get the band back on the road after years of not performing live. Some wild destinations were suggested, but instead, ideas of a tour culminated in the Rooftop Concert on January 30th, 1969, which was the last time the Beatles would ever perform live together as a group. Ringo says, There was a plan to play live somewhere. We were wondering where we could go. Oh, the Palladium or the Sahara, but we would have had to have taken all of our stuff. So we decided, let's get up on this roof. This seemingly simple idea resulted in one of the band's most memorable performances. Although George Martin did the original mixing for the album, Phil Spector did the final mix and was given the producer credit. After constant arguing during the recording sessions, George Martin and the Beatles shelled the Let It Be tapes and went on to work on Abbey Road. Let It Be was sitting around until John and George gave the tapes to Phil Spector, who added orchestral arrangements, choirs, overdubs, and chatter from the studio to the album. When asked about not getting the producer credit, George Martin said, I produced the original, and what you should do is have a credit saying produced by George Martin, overproduced by Phil Spector. There is another version of the album titled Let It Be, Naked, which was released in 2003. It's a different mix of Let It Be, omitting almost all of Phil Spector's embellishments and replaced Dig It and Maggie May with Don't Let Me Down. Let It Be Naked was a project initiated by Paul, as he didn't like the way Phil Spector produced the original album. Paul believed Let It Be didn't capture the album's intention of getting back to the band's original roots, which is why Let It Be Naked is so much more stripped down. The original album cover was meant to be one that mimicked the album cover of their first album, Please Please Me, which was released in 1963. This image shows the four Beatles looking down a staircase at the EMI house. However, this shot was instead used for the compilation album 1967 to 1970, otherwise known as the Blue Album. It was a very full circle image and its similarity to Please Please Me cover is incredibly nostalgic. Therefore, it would have been cool for the final album they released to share this cover. George quit during the recording of Let It Be on January 10, 1969. George felt that both John and Paul weren't allowing him to express himself musically or contribute to their songs as he pleased. After a particularly frustrating recording session and built up resentment, George quit, reportedly saying to the rest of the band, see you around the clubs. He eventually came back after the band agreed to finish recording in Apple Studios instead of Twickenham Film Studios. The album features another musician other than the Beatles, keyboardist Billy Preston. He played the electric piano on songs including Dig a Pony, I've Got a Feeling, One After 909, The Long and Winding Road, and Get Back, and the Hammond organ on Dig It and Let It Be. Billy was also important for easing the tension between the four Beatles. George Harrison, who invited Billy to come play, says the following on the impact of his presence in the studio. He got on the electric piano and straight away there was 100% improvement in the vibe in the room. Having this fifth person was just enough to cut the ice that we'd created amongst ourselves. Billy didn't know all the politics and the games that had been going on. So in his innocence, he got stuck in and gave an extra little kick to the band. Everybody was happier to have somebody else playing and it made what we were doing more enjoyable. We all played better and that was a great session. There is a new Let It Be film coming out. Director Peter Jackson is working with the 50 plus hours of footage and making a new documentary that shows the positive moments from the recording sessions. The original documentary, which only screened in theaters for a few weeks and is now incredibly rare to find it in its entirety, showed many of the band's lowest moments and painted a picture of negativity. However, Jackson says that after watching all of the footage, he sees friends working together and wants to focus on this in the new film. He says this film will be the ultimate fly on the wall experience. It's like a time machine transports us back to 1969 and we get to sit in the studio watching these four great musicians make music together. Although the album's production was stressful and caused professional rifts within the band, there were still many positive moments. As mentioned, the original Let It Be documentary casted an image of complete tension and negativity over the band and their relationships. However, those that were present for the recording say that there was still a friendly atmosphere, specifically through the band's humor. Glenn Johns, the sound engineer for Let It Be, says the following. There was some amazing stuff. 
Their humor got to me as much as the music, and I didn't stop laughing for six weeks. John Lennon only had to walk in a room, and I'd just crack up. Their whole mood was wonderful, and that was the thing. And there was all this nonsense going on at the time about the problems surrounding the group and the press being at them. And in fact, there they were, just doing it, having a wonderful time and being incredibly funny. And none of that's in the film. Abbey Road is the Beatles' triumphant last return to the recording studio after recording Let It Be, with songs like Come Together, Something, Oh Darling, I Want You, and Here Comes the Sun. This album is one of the most beloved records ever made and holds a special place in the hearts of Beatles fans all over the world. Today, we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Abbey Road. Let's do this. Although Let It Be is the official last Beatles record released, Abbey Road is the final album the Beatles recorded. Many people believe that the group knew the end was near and therefore made an effort to come together and create a swan song album. However, every single Beatle has since denied knowing this would be the last album. George Martin looks back on the feelings in the recording studio. He says, Nobody knew for sure that it was going to be the last album, but everybody felt it was. The Beatles had gone through so much and for such a long time. They'd been incarcerated with each other for nearly a decade, and I was surprised that they had lasted as long as they did. I wasn't at all surprised they split up because they all wanted to lead their own lives, and I did too. It was a release for me as well. Before being titled Abbey Road, this final album had a different name. Everest. That name was inspired by the brand of cigarettes sound engineer Jeff Emmerich smoked. The Beatles liked the imagery of the silhouette of Mount Everest depicted on the pack. Paul says, while we were in the studio, our engineer Jeff Emmerich always used to smoke cigarettes called Everest, so the album was going to be called Everest. We never really liked that, but we couldn't think of anything else to call it. Then one day I said, I've got it. I don't know how I thought of it. Abbey Road. It's the studio we're in, which is fabulous, and it sounds a bit like a monastery. Funny enough, engineer John Kurlander recalls a more lazy reason for the name, saying, It was around July when it was very hot outside that someone mentioned the possibility of the four of them taking a private plane over the foothills of Mount Everest to shoot the cover photograph. But as they became more enthusiastic to finish the LP, someone, I don't remember whom, suggested, Look, I can't be bothered to schlep all the way over to the Himalayas for a cover. Why don't we just go outside, take the photo there, call the LP Abbey Road, and have done with it? That's my memory of why it became Abbey Road. Because they couldn't be bothered to go to Tibet and get cold. It's hard to know the actual truth, but that kind of candid, flippant reasoning just seems so Beatles to me. Oh dear. George Harrison's Something is truly a remarkably gorgeous song, even being heralded as the best love song ever written by Frank Sinatra. John, Paul, and Ringo adore George's masterpiece, all of them calling it the high point of the album, John Lennon most notably and succinctly calling it, quote, about the best track on the album. As we well know, Paul is a man who can put the time in and work. That's just a fact. And for Oh Darling, he wanted it to sound as though he'd been performing on stage for a week. He says, I mainly remember wanting to get the vocal right, wanting to get it good. I tried it with a hand mic. I tried it with a standing mic. I tried it every which way and finally got the vocal I was reasonably happy with. It's a bit of a belter and if it comes off a little bit lukewarm, then you've missed the whole point. It was unusual for me. I would normally try all the goes at a vocal in one day. And John's response was interesting. John says, Oh Darling was a great one of Paul's that he didn't sing too well. I always thought that I could have done it better. It was more my style than his. He wrote it, so what the hell, he's going to sing it. If he'd had any sense, he would have let me sing it. Dude, Paul was getting roasted, Jesus. And sadly, none of the Beatles enjoyed Paul's Maxwell Silver Hammer, like they couldn't stand it. And for this interesting fact, I see no better moment than to bring back, by popular demand, the Beatles Bunch. The Beatle Bunch, the Beatle Bunch, and what they all thought of Paul's new song. That's Paul. I hate it. 
because all I remember is the track. He made us do it a hundred million times. He did everything to make it into a single and it never was and it never could have been, but he put guitar licks on it and had somebody hitting an iron pieces. And we spent more money on that song than any of them in the whole album, I think. Sometimes Paul would make us do these really fruity songs. I mean, my God, Maxwell Silverhammer was so fruity. After a while, we did a good job on it, but when Paul got an idea or an arrangement in his head, the worst session ever was Maxwell Silverhammer. It was the worst track we ever had to record. It went on for fucking weeks. I thought it was mad. They got annoyed because Maxwell Silverhammer took three days to record. Big deal. Originally, Her Majesty was between Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam, but Paul didn't like it there, so he chucked it. However, through a series of fortunate events, engineer John Curlander, who is instructed to never throw anything away, put it at the end of the song, The End. When Paul heard it there, he liked it in that context, and that's why it's a nice secret little track. Let It Be certainly had its ups and downs and put pressure on everyone involved. And keep in mind, George Martin was a grown man. He wasn't in his late 20s. So when they were carrying on like they tended to carry on, he just didn't want to deal with it. But Paul pleaded with him and George agreed with the condition that he had complete control in the studio, like in the old days. Along with Ringo's incredible drum solo in the song, The End, of course he had to be convinced because Ringo despises drum solos. This is the only Beatles song to feature a solo by every member. It was basically a musical battle between John, Paul, and George on the guitar over Love You, Love You in the background. One of my favorite quotes about the Beatles actually comes from Jeff Emmerich about this awesome event. Jeff says, the idea for guitar solos was very spontaneous and everybody said, yes, definitely. Well, except for George, who was a little apprehensive at first, but he saw how excited John and Paul were, so he went along with it. Truthfully, I think they rather liked the idea of playing together, not really trying to outdo one another per se, but engaging in some real musical bonding. Yoko was about to go into the studio with John, this was commonplace by now, and he actually told her, no, not now, let me do this, it'll just take a minute. That surprised me a bit. Maybe he felt like he was returning to his roots with the boys. Who knows? John really didn't like the medley on the album, preferring to have his song on one side of the album and Paul's on the other. John says, I like the A side. I never liked that sort of pop opera on the other side. I think it's junk. It was just bits of songs thrown together. I can't remember what some of it is. Come Together is all right, and some things on it. It was a competent album, like Rubber Soul in a way. It was together in that way, but it had no life really. As a fan of music, it's really hard to hear things like that, isn't it? I respect his opinion, but it's not easy to hear an artist you love dislike their own music, because personally, I adore the medley. I've always thought it was such a cool Beatles thing to do. What do you think? Abbey Road is one of the Beatles' finest, most beloved records. It was a smash hit and a massive inspiration to musicians around the world, as not only a collection of songs, but the embodiment of the Beatles and who they were and where they were going. It led to an untold number of parodies of the boys crossing that fateful street, and even led to a live webcam you can watch now of people walking, posing, and celebrating good music with each step. I can't help but get a little misty-eyed when I think about the lyrics in the song, The End. Almost like a goodbye, but a mantra. I've been repeating it since I was a child when I first heard the song. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. That's not just good music. That's a message that should be shared anywhere it can be. The Beatles' Abbey Road Medley, a collection of songs that has to be one of the most integral moments in rock and roll history. You Never Give Me Your Money, Sun King, and so many more unfinished songs strung together brilliantly to create the iconic end to one of the Beatles' most celebrated albums. Today, it gives me great joy to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Abbey Road Medley, the long one. Kicking off the Abbey Road Medley in perfect Beatles fashion is, wouldn't you know, a micro medley containing three unfinished songs Paul McCartney had composed. For the sake of clarity, we'll title these pieces You Never Give Me Your Money, Out of College, and One Sweet Dream. 
Unlike John Lennon and George Harrison, Paul didn't usually write songs about his life specifically. Yes, of course, he did make a few like Hey Jude for John's son Julian and Penny Lane about his childhood. But while John had songs like In My Life, A Day in the Life, and Julia touching upon deep-rooted personal experiences, Paul enjoyed concentrating on creative narratives that were fictitious. Paul's lyricism wasn't often literal, and he recalls George Harrison commenting on Paul's ability to author a story from nothing, stating, I remember George once saying to me, I couldn't write songs like that. He writes more from personal experience. John's style was to show the naked truth. If I was a painter, I'd probably mask things a little bit more than some people. But during the time of Abbey Road, with an imminent disbanding looming for the Beatles, Paul elects to take a more literal approach to You Never Give Me Your Money, which is a direct reference to the business turmoil the lads were going through in 1969, with a bit of a mask to hide anything overt. After marrying Linda Eastman in March 1969 and spending three weeks in New York meeting his new in-laws in April that year, Paul begins the tune about his perspective on money troubles. Paul says, this was me directly lambasting Alan Klein's attitude to us. No money, just funny paper, all promises, and it never works out. It's basically a song about no faith in the person that found its way into the medley on Abbey Road. John saw the humor in it. George Harrison continues this explanation of funny paper, saying, That's what we get. We get bits of paper saying how much we earned and what this and that is, but we never actually get it in pounds, shillings, and pence. We've all got a big house and a car and office, but to actually get the money we've earned seems impossible. You never give me your money is, I think, all these business meetings that we had to go through to sort out the past. It came out in Paul's song. The second segment of the song, Out of College, goes on to comment on the success of the Beatles and their ascension into fame and fortune, getting the sack from a job you despise and the magic feeling of finally attaining your dreams. On Paul's original lyric scrolled on a piece of paper, we can see that nowhere to go is spelled with a K for no, like knowing where to go. Indicating out of the misery of business issues, Paul finds a silver lining and thus leads us into the most uplifting part of the song, One Sweet Dream, which just has the most fantastic story behind it. Shifting gear and quite literally getting away this segment of the song depicts a true habit of Paul and Linda as they quite enjoyed getting into a car on their own and getting lost in the countryside to escape London. Linda concurs by saying, as a kid I love getting lost. I would say to my father, let's get lost. Then when I moved to England to be with Paul, we would put Martha in the back of the car and drive out of London. As soon as we were on the open road I'd say, let's get lost and we'd keep driving without looking at any signs. And finally, the little phrase, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven, is a children's jump rope rhyme that was certainly around during the Beatles' childhoods, but it could have easily been inspired by Linda's daughter, Heather, to Paul. The full poem goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. When you get there, God will say, where's that book you stole away? If you say, I don't know, he will send you down below, where everything is red hot peppers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. When you get there, angels say, your school name, children, right this way. Being perhaps the inception of the idea for George Harrison's Here Comes the Sun, while John could be heard in the studio singing Here Comes the Sun, Whoa, the Sun, on the proto version of Sun King before George had written Here Comes the Sun, John had been working on Sun King for weeks, but it just never found itself complete as their schedule was full to the brim. Songwriting time must have been very hard to find for the Beatles. Serendipitously, Paul inquires if John had any partial unfinished songs for his medley concept on the second side of Abbey Road. John agrees, mentioning it just seemed like the easier option than attempting to actually finish it, John says. It was just half a song I had which I had never finished, which was one way of getting rid of it without ever finishing it. Then in the medley we just wanted a change of atmosphere, and here comes the Sun King, why not? And here he comes, and everybody's happy, and quando para mucho, etc. Not without mentioning later that it was, quote, a piece of garbage I had laying around. John had alluded to the idea that the song came to him in a dream, not uncommon for a Beatles seeing that Let It Be came to Paul in his dreams. John, being an avid reader, was perhaps influenced by Nancy Mitford's book entitled The Sun King. It's possible John, after reading the book, dreamt of the king in his palace, seeing everyone laughing, everyone happy. A fan favorite of the song is the use of Spanish interludes full of errant phrases the lads knew. John says, 
you know, singing cuando para mucho. So we just made it up. Paul knew a few Spanish words from school, you know. So we just strung any Spanish words that sounded vaguely like something. And of course, we got Chica Ferdi in. That's a Liverpool expression. Just like sort of, it doesn't mean anything. Just like na 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 na. Chica Ferdi is a Scouse dialect phrase, as John said, to taunt other children. Paul hilariously remarks on this term by saying, there was a thing in Liverpool that us kids used to do, which is instead of saying fuck off, we would say Chica Ferdi. In that song, we just kind of made up things, and we were all in on the joke. We were thinking that nobody would know what it meant, and most people would think, oh, it must be Spanish, or something. But we got a little seditious word in there. Written in the spring of 1968 in India by John, Mean Mr. Mustard was actually in consideration for the Beatles' previous White Album, but never made it there. Instead, it found itself recorded back to back with Sun King. I personally adore this song, which I'm sure many of you do as well. However, John really didn't seem to feel the same way as you'll see in this next quote. John says, In Mean Mr. Mustard, I said his sister Pam. Originally, it was his sister Shirley in the lyric. I changed it to Pam to make it sound like it had something to do with polythene Pam. They are only finished bits of crap that I wrote in India. That's me, writing a piece of garbage. I'd read somewhere in the newspaper about this mean guy who had five pound notes, not up his nose, but somewhere else. No, it had nothing to do with cocaine. In that article, we can see direct lyrical influences such as this excerpt that John must have read. Mean husband who shaved and went to bed in the dark to save light. He also insisted that the lights be turned off while he and his wife were listening to the radio because it was not necessary to see in order to listen. Of course, this inspired the lyrics shaves in the dark trying to save paper. Firstly, I don't know what it is about this song, but it's one of my favorite Beatles songs to work out to. It's got such a fantastic groove, really gets you going. But its story is even more intriguing. Again, born in India in 1968 by John, John tells the tale of a sexually liberated woman that was inspired by two separate people. One being Pat Dawson with the sobriquet polythene Pat with a T, and the other was beat poet Royston Ellis' girlfriend Stephanie. How Pat got that nickname has got to be one of the most bizarre facts you'll hear today, probably. Probably. Polythene is plastic, and well, Pat liked to eat plastic. She was also an early adopter and friend of the Beatles when she was a child, Pat says. I started going to see the Beatles in 1961 when I was 14 and got quite friendly with them. If they were playing out of town, they'd give me a lift back home in their van. It was about the same time that I started getting called Polythene Pat. It's embarrassing, really. I just used to eat polythene all the time. I tie it into knots and then eat it. Sometimes I even used to burn it and then eat it when it got cold. Then I had a friend who got a job in a polythene bag factory, which was wonderful because it meant I had a constant supply. Okay. <laughs> and the second was a bit more, shall we say, fetishy. John remarks on meeting poet Royston Ellis and his girlfriend, Stephanie, for what might have been a particularly groovy night for John. John says, that was me, remembering a little event with a woman and a man who was England's answer to Allen Ginsberg, who gave us our first exposure. This is so long. You can't deal with all of this. You see, everything triggers amazing memories. I met him when we were on tour, and he took me back to his apartment. And I had a girl, and he had one he wanted me to meet. He said she dressed in polythene, which she did. She didn't wear jackboots and kilts, I just sort of elaborated. Perverted sex in a polythene bag, just looking for something to write about. In August 1963, the couple invited John to their apartment and the three wore polythene and shared a bed for that evening. But before you start getting ideas, this quote by the poet put their evening in better perspective. He says, We read all these things about leather and we didn't have any leather, but I had my oilskins and we had some polythene bags from somewhere. We all dressed up in them and wore them in bed. John stayed the night with us in the same bed. I don't think anything very exciting happened. And we all wondered what the fun was in being kinky. It was probably more my idea than John's. Polythene Pam and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window were recorded as one in July 1969, inspired by some mischievous fans known as the Apple Scruffs. When Paul would vacate his London home, these kids would literally break into his house and steal his stuff. Jesus Christ, that's terrifying. Anyway, it's believed that some fans found a ladder in his garden and used it to launch themselves through his bathroom window. On one occasion, stealing a photo that Paul held dear to his heart, he even expressed that he would like it returned because of its sentimental value. I don't think it has been, but I'm not sure. 
It should also be mentioned that the Moody Blues keyboardist Mike Pinder told Paul a story about a girl sneaking into their bandmate's Ray Thomas's room and spending the night with him. Perhaps it's a blend of the two. Furthermore, John Lennon asserts that maybe it was actually about Linda, saying, That's Paul's song. He wrote that when we were in New York announcing Apple. And we first met Linda. Maybe she's the one that came in through the window. I don't know. Somebody came in through the window. But that's pretty vague. For the quitting of the police department in the song, Paul mentions that after his two-week stay in New York in a taxi heading to JFK Airport, the final verse just fell in his lap. Paul says, so I got so I quit the police department, which are part of the lyrics to that. This was the great thing about the randomness of it all. If I hadn't been in this guy's cab, or if it had been someone else driving, the song would have been different. Also, I had a guitar there so I could solidify it into something straight away. Inspired by an Elizabethan poet Thomas Decker's poem, Cradle Song, that was in Paul's stepsister Ruth's piano book, Paul begins to put music to the lyrics that weren't in the actual tune because he couldn't read the music. Paul says, I was flicking through it and came to Golden Slumbers. I can't read music and I couldn't remember the old tune, so I just started playing my own tune to it. I liked the words so I kept them, and it fitted with another bit of the song I had. That was a 400-year-old poem and it was set to music by Peter Warlock in the early 1920s. Recorded together with Golden Slumbers, Carry That Weight was yet another McCartney reference to the issues going Going on in the group, even though it was just an uproariously uplifting powerhouse of a tune. Paul says, I'm generally quite upbeat, but at certain times things get to me so much I can't be upbeat anymore. And that was one of those times. We were taking so much acid and doing so much drugs and all this Klein shit was going on and getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Carry that weight a long time like forever. That's what I meant. Oh man, this has got to be one of my absolute favorite Beatles song ever. And it really is down to how ecstatic I am over Ringo's drum part. He hated doing drum solos, and to be honest, I'm usually not a big fan of them either. But just the way he composed it was just so special. I mean, you can literally sing this entire drum part. That's not usually the case with drum solos. Without counting Her Majesty, this would have been the final song on the album as the Beatles exit the medley. Jeff Emmerich recalls the work it took to get Ringo to do that drum solo. Jeff said, the thing that always amused me was how much persuasion it took to get Ringo to play that solo. Usually you have to try to talk drummers out of doing solos. He didn't want to do it, but everybody said, no, no, it'll be fantastic. So he gave in and turned in a bloody marvelous performance. It took a while to get right, and I think Paul helped with some ideas, but it's fantastic. I always want to hear more. That's how good it is. It's so musical. It's not just a drummer going off. And we can't forget about the smashing dueling guitar solos. Each one represents of John, George, and Paul's different playing styles. Jeff continues, the idea for guitar solos was very spontaneous and everybody said yes, definitely. Well, except for George, who was a little apprehensive at first, but he saw how excited John and Paul were, so he went along with it. Truthfully, I think they rather liked the idea of playing together, not really trying to outdo one another per se, but engaging in some real musical bonding. Yoko was about to go into the studio with John, this was commonplace by now, and he actually told her, no, not now, let me just do this, it'll just take a minute. That surprised me a bit, maybe he felt like he was returning to his roots with the boys, who knows. Paul wanted to end the song with something meaningful, so in Shakespearean fashion, he wrote one of the most beautiful pieces of lyrics the Beatles have ever created. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And of course, John Lennon was enamored with that line, but as is the case with John, he couldn't help but get in a little jab at Paul. John says, that's Paul again, the unfinished song, right? We're on Abbey Road, just a piece at the end. He had a line in it, and in the end, the love you get is equal to the love you give, which is a very cosmic philosophical line, which again proves that if he wants to, he can think. John is notorious for his critical comments on the Beatles' music, including his own songs, so his perspective on the medley can't be neglected in this video. John says, Abbey Road was really unfinished songs, all stuck together. Everybody praises the album so much, but none of the songs had anything to do with each other. No thread at all, only the fact that we stuck them together. I like the A side. I never liked that sort of pop opera on the other side. I think it's junk. It was just bits of songs thrown together, and I can't remember what some of it is. Come Together is alright, and some things on it. It was a competent album, like Rubber Soul. It was together in that way, but it had no life really. 
Although John had his issues with the medley, it has to be one of the most integral events to the entirety of the Beatles catalog, proving an unfinished song by the Beatles could carry with it enough charm and talent to create a musical menagerie on the B-side of an album. Each one having so much history and storytelling behind it, it truly shows the power of songwriting when you think outside of the box, and we are all so grateful. Man, Abbey Road is such an incredible album and such a phenomenal medley. I wanted to thank you all for supporting the channel and getting us to 100,000 subscribers. Can you believe it? 100, that's incredible. And I'm just, really, just, words don't cover it. A little bit about me. My family is from Trinidad and Tobago, which is a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela. My parents, without a nickel in their pocket, immigrated with my brother to the States and had me. My dad often tells me, without provocation, that I was unplanned. I grew up in the Bronx in the 90s and we were quite poor. So poor, in fact, that we all had to sleep in the same bed till I was five or six years old. However, being the determined people they were, my parents achieved great success and altered the course of our family. Somehow or another, before high school, I managed to have not a single friend in the world, so I spent a lot of time on my own practicing music. My parents exposed me to the music of their generation, the Beatles, Cat Stevens, Eagles, and I found comfort in the optimistic vibe of the 60s. I was a poor student. My favorite class in Catholic school was religion, mostly because I enjoyed discussing philosophy and the humanity of people. I learned to sing in that church. I attended one of the most prestigious performing arts high schools in the Northern Hemisphere, LaGuardia in Manhattan, for theater, often nicknamed the Fame School, which has alumni ranging from Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and all the way to Adrian Brody. I was a professional actor doing commercials, off-Broadway performances, and a few stints on network television. Through the course of life, that was ripped away from me, and I found myself in the suburbs of Florida. I met the love of my life at a play. I would marry her years later at a zoo. I started a band, then another, then another. We got close to something, working with a six-time Grammy award-winning producer who took us under his wing. But when the veil came down, he turned out to be a fiend, so I abandoned ship, and this resulted in years of working at my father's business, fixing cars. New York, acting, music, it was just a distant dream. The person I was and the promise I had made to my childhood self, I had failed to fulfill. I asked for a sign and was greeted with a catastrophic panic attack that upended my life. I went on a long road trip across the country to find myself in my old Mustang. And when I came back, I started this channel and that brings us to today. We bought a forest and an antique home, a train ride away from Manhattan so I could pursue acting all over again. But unfortunately for most of us, the virus has put the brakes on this endeavor for now. But I made a new promise to myself that I knew I could accomplish. It's that whatever it is I'm looking for, I promise I'm going to die trying to find it. So that's the story of me. And here are some of my favorite clips from the channel. We've done a few covers. She's a kind of girl to throw my love away But I still love her so Don't hurt me now, don't hurt me now All your life You were only waiting for this moment to be free Blackbird fly A few scenes It was so upset over the whole Yoko thing and the fact that I was becoming as creative and dominating as I had been in the early days. I still had this God will save us feeling about it. That it's gonna be all right. That's why I did it. I wanted to talk. I wanted to say my piece about revolution. I. I wanted to tell you 
or whoever's listening, I wanted to say, what do you say? This is what I say. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Work with some of my best friends, having a laugh. Their undisputed masterpieces, Taxman, a song so catchy, most people probably don't listen to the lyrics. Release an album. <laughs> and been to many places. I'd like to thank my brothers Rishi and Josh, my mother and father and my wife's parents, best friends Brad for being my scene partner, Dan for producing my music, and Steph for putting us on the Abbey Road wall. Leah Robbins, our contributing author and social media manager, and of course, my lovely wife Lindsay, who is literally the only reason this was possible. I thank you all for this opportunity to share my music, my interests, and the community that has welcomed me regardless of my many shortcomings. I don't know what the future has in store for me, but whatever it is, I know I won't have to face it alone. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you once more for this incredible milestone. See you next time.